Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of our Thrive in China Roundtable, where we discuss relevant topics about setting up in China, moving into the region, um, and taking care of corporate administration measures that have to happen. Now, we'd love to understand who our audience is. If you could share with us, are you a newbie in China? Are you a startup or are you an experienced China hand? This always helps us to know who's in the community, what is kind of the percentages of people within the community, and it helps steer um, the presentations, the content in those presentations. So please do give us that insight. If you haven't been to the roundtables before, allow me to introduce who I am. My name is Christina kohler Colucci. I'm the head of business advisory at Woodburn Accountants and Advisors, and I'm a leading expert on inbound investment into China. I have over 18 years of experience in corporate services, corporate administration, and corporate compliance. Um, and we are actually headquartered in Hong Kong with our subsidiary then in Shanghai. We've helped over 600 companies with their market entry, um, pre-investment advisory, as well as their implementation and growth in China, as well as in Hong Kong. We offer a series of administrative processes to help our clients understand the China waters, um, whether it's our China roadmap, saving your brand, um, setting up in China, recruiting people, working with accountants in China, et cetera. Um, we help you to create that foundation that you have the ability to focus on growing and scaling. Now, if you have not received a free copy, we're offering this to our entire community. If you haven't received a copy of our ebook, The 10 Biggest Mistakes Companies Make in China, please email me at christina at woodburnglobal.com and I would be very happy to give you a free copy. So we have hit round table number 20 in 2023. Um, the topic for today is saving your brand in China. Now, this is a very, um, emotional topic for me because uh, a good 15, 16 years ago, uh, an IP squatter reached out to us um, having just uh, uh, registered our brand two weeks before we had submitted our application. Um, and we had to go through a very difficult period of understanding what we were going to do, whether we we're gonna purchase our brand from him, whether we were um, going to rebrand. Um, and in the end, the decision for us was to completely rebrand, finally register our new trademark, and then um, go through the whole tedious process of redoing our marketing material and all our content and everything else. So this is a very um, emotional topic for me. I went through it. And obviously, my spiel is helping others to be able to avoid the same mistake that I have personally done. So what I want people to understand is, or to evaluate, is how much is your brand worth to you? Every brand has a value, right? Um, obviously, if you're a consumer brand, your, your actual brand value is going to weigh out more than if you're a service company like us. But there is a certain value associated with one which is monetary and one which is actual bureaucratic and um, you know what would it cost you to rebrand in a, in a specific market if you had to rebrand, right? So I want you all to evaluate when you are thinking about the Chinese market, how much is your brand worth to you? If somebody has taken your brand, what actions are you going to do to get that brand back or create a new brand? And we're gonna go through all of this today um, in, terms of, in terms of branding. Now, the first thing that I want to highlight for the Chinese market is to realize what is a trademark. Um, so in terms of IP, there are three categories. Obviously, there's trademarks, there's patents, and there is copyrights. In today's presentation, we're going to be focusing on trademarks. Um, I'm not a patent lawyer. That is something that's very specific. Um, that's something that really needs to be done by a patent lawyer who has experience probably in your industry or in your sector. Um, copyright also publishing is restricted in China, so it's really important to understand copywriting laws um, and working with a lawyer who has specific experience in that category. But in terms of trademarks, a trademark can be anything, 
can be a word, can be a design, can be letters of the alphabet, numerals, three-dimensional symbols, combinations of colors, etc. Prior to 2002, three-dimensional symbols uh, or combination of colors were not accepted. Um, but however, since 2002, it's readily available. Okay, what you need to be aware of, though, in China, is that country names. So using things like United Kingdom, um, France is not permissible. Uh, anything with international organizations like the Red Cross is not permissible. Um, also generic things. So for example, if you've got a generic motto um, or a company name that is also generic, you won't be able to register your company, okay? Um, and by generic, I mean something like uh, international, um, Cross country shoes limited. Um, international, it, you can't trademark that. International can be for anybody. Cross country shoes is a product. You can't restrict that just for yourself. Um, and hence why you wouldn't be able to register it. And I'll go into details. If you can't register your trademark, what does that mean for you? Okay. So I just wanted to give you an example, uh, and I'm using my own logo and brand assets for to reference this. So in our brand assets, we've got a logo and we've got words, right? We've got the logo, which is the WB in a circle, and we've got Woodburn Accountants and Advisors. Now in China, in order to be fully protected, you would want to do the combination of logo and words. You would want to just do the logo and you would just want to do the words. In the classes and subclasses, um, of products and services that you are catering to where the activities you are doing are, are going to be performed. So you can decide what is of value to you, what you're gonna be using in the Chinese market um, and understand how, how, what that's going to bring you. Now, the next question is who should be registering their trademarks in China, okay? It's a very, very simple answer. Everyone that is doing business in China should be registering their trademarks in China. If you're simply doing business trips, register your trademark in China. If you're doing marketing and branding initiatives, register your trademark in China. If you are trading with companies in China, register your trademark in China. If you are manufacturing your products in China, you need to register your trademarks in China. If you are offering services to companies in China, you should be registering your, 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 brand, your, your brand assets in China. And I want to emphasize here, it does not matter whether you have a company in China or not. If you are doing these activities, even from your home jurisdiction, with entities that are in China, you should be registering your trademark in China. Okay, This is why the general term, everyone that is doing business in China should be registering their trademark in China. Now, I want to start off with certain decisions that you have to make when you are registering your trademark in China, okay? So a very easy five point action plan. The first thing you need to understand is what brand assets do you want to use? Do you wish to register in China? But more important to that, more important than that is what brand assets are you actually going to be using in China? And in order to analyze that, you need to think about the product, the packaging, the marketing and branding initiatives, and any documents you might have associated with that, okay? So let's say you are manufacturing a cup, okay? And actually this is a perfect example because here is a logo on this cup. You are manufacturing this in China, you're exporting it, you need to be registering this logo because you're manufacturing it in China. If you're selling it in China, you need to be registering this logo because it is on the cup. What I don't have here is now the packaging that is going to house this cup. What brand asset is going on that packaging? When you're dealing with the contracts to purchase or manufacture these cups with the logo on it, what documents are you signing? Is your logo or any brand assets on those contracts? So it's really, really analyzing in depth where are your brand assets going to be seen in the territory of China. And once you've analyzed that, and you under, underline, understand the breakdown of that, the next point is understanding what classes and subclasses are you going to be registering your brand assets on. 
Now, I don't have on the top of my head the class in which cups are under, but I make it up. Let's say it's class five, uh, subclass five, um, five, uh, 301. That means you're gonna be registering this cup in class five under uh, 5301 in terms of this logo, okay? So it's understanding the class system, understanding that there are 45 classes, thousands of subclasses, and you need to go into the categories to really highlight and understand the activities that you are going to be doing in the mainland Chinese, the Chinese mainland territory, okay? Now, in order to aid you on this, as a starting point, what I tell a lot of my clients is that hopefully you've registered your trademark in your home jurisdiction. Uh, if you haven't, why? Because that might aid in understanding whether you have to do it in China or not. And when you registered your trademark in your home jurisdiction, under what classes and subclasses did you register? Under? This will act as a starting point to analyze what classes and subclasses you should register under in China. Okay. The third step is doing a search, a search whether your brand assets are already registered in China in those classes and subclasses that you've chosen, whether there are similar brand assets with similar designs, similar words, or whether somebody has already registered it or not. Okay. Now, if step three is successful, where it looks like you can register your trademark, you've got to decide which entity is going to own those trademarks. Is it an individual or is it an entity? And then you go ahead and register your trademark. And I'm gonna show you the document list, it's very simple in terms of what that step is. Now, what I want to talk about next are two important legislative points associated with registering your trademarks in China. The first is conducting a search before filing. Now, there is absolutely no requirement for you to do a search prior to filing. However, we had one client who did not do a search and found out nine months later after submitting the documents that there were too many similar marks to allow the trademark office to grant the application. So they had to start from scratch, losing nine months, okay? Um, the story that I mentioned about myself early on, even if I had done a search, which I had done a search, um, the IP squatter had registered two weeks before us. It wasn't even in the database system yet. So that was our unfortunate situation where we lost nine months having not known we were going to be losing nine months. Um, but do conduct a search because this will give you insight as to whether there is already somebody out there who has squatted your brand assets or whether there are too many similar marks for you to even get registered, or somebody totally out of your industry or sector has registered in your classes. You know, there are a lot of decisions then, or not decisions, there's a lot of information that will then come to you to where you then decide to either proceed or not proceed with the registration. Um, one thing I wanna highlight is that if somebody has a reg already registered your, your brand assets in China, if they have not used those brand assets for three consecutive years, it means that that brand asset can be subject to cancellation and can cause it to be inactive, meaning you can take over that application, okay? Um, a big important aspect in this whole consideration is whether there are too many similar marks um, for you to be able to register at all. Now, I do wanna highlight that the CTMO office, the China Trademark Office, will never give you an, an opinion as to whether you should register or not register. So our advice here is either go with a, a corporate services firm, go with an IP lawyer to actually give you that analysis or that opinion as to what makes sense for you. The next thing I wanna highlight as a legislative regime is the fact that in China, it is a first to file system. Now, the advantage of, of the first to file system is that whoever is the first party to register will be granted the rights to that trademark. The registration, or sorry, that the validity of that application is valid for up to 10 years. Renewal process has to happen six months prior to the expiry date. The application can take between 12, 12 can take about 12 months now. Um, depends on the backlog of the CTMO office in terms of the applications. But it does, it does take about a year for the whole application process to be completed. 
the disadvantage of the first to file system is that anybody can take a brand asset and register it. Whether they, you know, whether they need it or not, they can register it. Anyone can lay claim to it. Again, if they are the first to file, they are the owner. Okay. Now, what this obviously means that is, is that if you are too late to the game, you may find that somebody else in China owns that trademark, which means that you potentially are blocked or locked out of the Chinese market, and you have to create a new strategy on what you're going to be doing with your brand assets in China. So this is why if you are doing any form of business in China, you should be thinking about registering your trademark as soon as possible. Now, let me highlight to you who the enemies are, okay? The enemies in China, there are two types. There are the hijackers. So in my mind, the hijackers are local Chinese businesses um, registering a trademark in China, fully knowing that it is registered by another company overseas. Um, what they see as an advantage is that they can demand licensing fees when that company enters the Chinese market. Um, they can also tarnish, tarnish the image, if they want, of that brand in China. They could sell inferior goods, inferior services, um, all under that same trademark. Okay, those are the hijackers. Now, the squatters are a little bit different. And I see squatters, not just in China, but everywhere around the world. These are generally individuals who are hearing about different brand names coming out of the woodwork globally, whether it's in cosmetics, whether it's in FNB. And basically they're checking, not just in China, but potentially in other jurisdictions, whether this brand has registered their trademark. And they go ahead and do the registration even before they've ever thought about the market. But what they're saying to themselves is they're probably going to enter at some point, maybe not now, maybe not next year, but maybe in the next three to five years, I would have already owned that and they will have to come to me to buy it. And then I can give any value I want. Right. Their idea is actually not to sell anything or make anything. It's actually to claim for licensing fees or to sell that trademark that they've registered at a, at a profit. Okay. Now, this is all done, obviously, in bad faith, right? And the CTMO office is trying to crack down on these squatters as well as hijackers in regards to bad faith filings. The issue is the fact that as the system is a first to file system, it is very, very difficult to block a bad faith, bad faith application. You will need to have evidence readily available to show that those brand owners have registered the mark in bad faith. And that honestly can be very hard to come by. The CTMO office has developed a database to track individuals have, who have done multiple bad faith filings on multiple brand assets to kind of curb, curb this trend. Um, but the issue is, is that these individuals they tend to file under shelf company names or file under their own individual name and to really be able to track them is extremely difficult. So you might have one brother file five, another brother file five, but actually they, and then it all gets mixed up and jumbled altogether, okay? So although the CTM office is trying to curb all of that, it, it is physically difficult to do, right? Now, Two things I want people to realize. One is that if somebody in China already has your brand assets, what you need to understand is that it's illegal for you to sell any goods or services bearing that trademark in China. So this cup, for example, you see this trademark right here. If somebody has already registered it, you won't have the ability to sell this cup with this logo on it, okay? If you're manufacturing this cup and somebody owns this logo and you're manufacturing it in China, it's actually illegal for you to manufacture it, even if you're using a third party manufacturer. If you are providing services, if you are marketing and branding yourself, um, it's illegal to do that, right? And what you need to understand is that 
if you are manufacturing in China, those, this would then be considered a counterfeit product and it could be seized at customs, particularly if the trademark owner has registered not just the registration with the China Trademark Office, but also registered it with the Customs Bureau. It will be in the customs system anytime there's an import or export with that logo on it. Okay. In addition to all of that, if a Chinese individual has registered your trademark, they're also manufacturing goods in China. They decide to export those goods to other jurisdictions, and they also decide to register in those other jurisdictions. It could effectively be taking your business away from other jurisdictions. Now, my job is only to talk about China and Hong Kong, but I do want people to look at the global span of things. And if you are planning to become an international company, a global company where you are producing and selling globally, you need to be thinking about registering your marks in other jurisdictions as well. Now, if somebody in China already owns your brand assets and has registered it in the classes and subclasses that you want to register in, but actually they're from completely different industries, what do you do at that point? And this is a, with my old organization, this is exactly what happened to us. Our company was called Kohler Group. As the logo states, incorporation tax accounting and trade services, we needed to register in class 35 in China. And we found out that the brand Kohler Toilets had registered in class 35. Completely separate industry, separate organization. They do nothing that we do. What this meant, though, was that we could not register Kohler Group in China. As you can see, although the spelling of Kohler is different, it is very similar, and hence we couldn't register it. And But that didn't mean we couldn't operate. We knew that because Kohler had already registered in class 35, we were safe because no other competitor could do the same. But on top of all of that, we also knew that because we were in completely indus different industries and sectors, we would never be sued for infringement we're not offering, we're not selling any products, right? We are an accounting um, uh, corporate services firm. So like this, we kept operating, um, knowing full well that Kohler had had the access. We did, however, register in two other classes um, for other services that we were doing. Um, class 35 is around business and corporate services. And, um, and so we, we kept, kept operating. So I just wanna highlight that if you find out in your search that somebody else in a different industry or sector has registered a similar brand name in the classes and subclasses you wanna register in, but you're totally different industries and sectors, you can still operate in China. And actually you have less risk of even a competitor stealing something from you or an IP squatter or hijacker taking something. I hope that makes sense um, to everybody. Now, let's touch on a little bit the application process. So there are four things that you have to do. Usually you have to sign a power of attorney to allow a local agent to submit the files at the CTMO office on your behalf. Normally a service provider, provider a local agent will have a order form that you have to complete highlighting and, or a service agreement, if you will, highlighting the classes and subclasses that you are looking to register in, as well as the brand assets you're looking to register under and the owner who's the owner of it. There's also gonna be a soft copy of the trademark in JPEG format, either the word mark or design mark that you have to submit. And then a copy of, of the applicant's proof. So if, for example, you say it's a UK company that's going to own it, you have to show the certificate of incorporation of the UK company to the CTMO office. So it's actually really easy. Like I said, the application does take about 12 months in China. It takes about eight months or six to eight months in Hong Kong. What I want people to realize is that once the registration is done, your homework should not stop. You should actually, particularly if you're in the products sector, you should be monitor monitoring your brand assets. Why do I say that? I say that because there are people out there who are continuously hijacking and squatting brand assets, trying to cause trouble, trying to sell inferior products, trying to tarnish the brand image of, of these companies. So monitoring your brand assets in order to lower the impact of 
potential damage to your brand is important, right? In addition to that, if you find people that are tarnishing your brand or are copying your, your brand assets, you've got to take them down for counterfeit or infringement, right? Now you can only take them down if you have registered your IP in China, if you have registered your brand assets in China, okay? Um, I've given here the example of Taobao, but if this does happen, one thing you can do is write to the internet service providers to inform them that you have discovered something on a website or on an e-commerce platform and they will review it. Alternatively, a lot of the e-commerce platforms like Taobao um, will have something on their website where you can make a denouncement or they also have Ali Protect. But again, you have to show proof that you own those brand assets and then they're gonna also do a review, okay? The goal of these platforms is obviously to show that they have certified brands um, that they are the real deal. And obviously, you know, there's so much content on these e-commerce platforms. There's so much content in the um, internet space in China that it's hard for just one company to track all of this. So they do want the help of the brands to be monitoring as well, okay? Um, because they do have a certain level of quality that they have to uphold as well to their consumers, showing to their consumers that they are buying not fake products, but actual genuine products, okay? And the CTMO office is supporting this. The e-commerce platforms are, are, are pushing on this. They even have departments purely focused on IP for brands. One of the requirements now to open an e-commerce platform is to actually show your trademark registrations, to verify that you, have, you own your IP. Um, they couldn't do it with past brands. It's, it's something that's relatively new that's happened recently. So monitoring your brand assets is something that I would highly, highly recommend. To conclude for today's session, you know, saving your brand, it's, it's something again that I'm very emotional about because somebody did take my brand. I had to go through a whole process of rebranding. It was hard. And it actually meant that I spent three to four months on this topic alone versus focusing in the business and growing the business. This was an obstacle that came at my door that really affected me for one whole quarter period of a calendar year. I don't want other people to make that same mistake, okay? I don't want people to have to evaluate whether they're going to have to spend money that they hadn't budgeted for to buy their brand back. I don't want people to have to think, oh my God, how are we going to rebrand? Are we okay that actually in the Chinese market, there's a whole separate brand? Now, if that's your strategy, that's fine, okay? If your strategy is to say, actually, we're going to come up with a Chinese name for our brand and that's we're going to use that as our brand asset in China, by all means do it, okay? I have no issues around that. However, if that's not your intention, then this is something you need to do today, okay? Another thing is remember that you're gonna be registering with the CTMO office. This is an application that we do, but you should also be thinking about registering with the customs bureaus. Um, that's something I, have, I don't have so much experience with. Usually it's your freight forwarders who will help you do that application with them. Um, whether you're trading, whether you're manufacturing, whether you're providing services, you want the peace of mind knowing that your IP is registered in China, protected in China, that your business can grow um, and scale up without ever having something halted, okay? You also don't want people to take your brand away. Um, you want to know that you will be in the market for good. Now, also, the last point I want people to consider is that if you do set up an entity in China, one of the easiest way to repatriate profit out of China is through trademark licensing agreements. And in order to implement that, you have to own the trademarks abroad in order to be able to then get capital out of China. So something you should be thinking about for the long-term vision of, of your China strategy. I hope today's video has helped. For those that are watching this live, for those that are watching this on replay, I always love to hear what your biggest takeaways from today's roundtable was. Again, if you have any questions, please insert them into the chat box. Um, we will touch that on, at the end. If you are struggling to evaluate your brand assets for China, or you wanna understand more about the registration process or more about our services on this, you can, I'll be sending you a link to our diary and you can set up a call and we can see if we can 
assist you or help you or guide you in the right direction um, that you have no pain points at all. Um, last but not least, if you enjoyed today's roundtable and you would like to join for others, uh, you have already registered, but if you have colleagues or friends who would like to join, the more the merrier, uh, you can give them access to woodburnglobal.com slash events and they can register. Last but not least, we have our last roundtable next week before the summer holidays. Um, next week's roundtable is how to recruit your first hires in China. So we're going to be going through how to find candidates, how to interview candidates, how to employ candidates, um, tips on what to avoid. Um, if you're interested in that, you're already all signed up, um, but just join again next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Central European time. And we will guide you through that. Um, there is a question that has popped in. Um, I have a question to your information about operating in China. Even if I couldn't register my trademark because of similar brands in the same class from other industries. Okay. So if there are, if you can't register your mark in China because there are too many similar brands, and the CTMO office is not granting you the application, you have to understand that there is always going to be a risk, okay? Especially if those similar brands are in the same industry and sector as you. So I'll give you the example of Kohler Toilets. If Kohler Toilets would have been um, actually in the services sector, there would always be a risk in my mind that they can sue us for infringement. So again, let me reiterate, if the CTMO office is saying that your application won't go through because of too many similar brand names, does not mean you have to stop operating. You just have to realize there is a risk of continuing to operate with that current brand name and that somebody who has a similar mark could sue you for infringement, okay? Um, how often does that happen? Not very often. People are in their own industry, you know, in their own world, and it's not identical. As long as it's not identical, you're okay. Awesome. Um, I hope that helps you with that question. If it's not clear, let me know. Um, and, uh, I can, I can, I can answer it further. Um, I'll just wait on if, if, if that works for you. And perfect, I'm glad that helped. Um, so just to finish off, thank you very much for joining us. Again, we are not distributing our presentations, but you will get a link to our archived roundtables for 2023. Unfortunately, my marketing exec is on holiday. So this will only be sent out on the week of the 3rd of July. So in two weeks, she's on holiday for two weeks. Um, so all of those recordings will be distributed in two weeks time. Apologies for that, but she also deserves a break. Um, and she does all of this admin work for me. I wanna thank everyone for joining and I hope to see you again next week. Take care. Remember next week's episode is on how to recruit your first hires. So if that does interest you, come along and join in. Take care and have a great day. Bye.